All right, everybody. I think we're still missing a few people, but maybe we'll maybe we'll just get going. I think uh, maybe it's now slowing some people down, but hopefully they'll trickle in. And but yeah, we'll get started so we can kind of keep along with the agenda for the day. But um, yeah, a lot of familiar faces from last time, but this is the second part of a four-part series for uh, planning for arm, on farm success. And today we're going to be kind of delving into marketing aspect of the business plan. Um, on the agenda today, Amita Greer, everybody remembers her from last time, hopefully. And uh, Amita's going to be walking us through uh, kind of an introduction to marketing and um, developing a strategic plan for marketing, identifying who those target customers are, and then knowing your competitors and some competitive advantage. And then after that, we'll take a, I think a, a short break, but then we'll have, uh, let's see here, Dave Prather, who is the general manager for the Western Montana Growers Co-op. He's going to be coming in, as well as Franco Salazar, who is the market master for the Clark Fork Market here in Missoula. And those two are kind of going to be giving us a, a regional outlook on you know, where there's potential um, holes in the market, where there's some um, opportunities, niches, things like that, hopefully. Kind of just give us an outlook on what's happening, so that'd be really interesting. And then we'll break for lunch, and then after that we'll have a farm panel. We have some folks from uh, County Rail Farm coming down. So they're going to be talking about um, what they're doing up on their farm. And so they're doing some unique things where they're maintaining their farm brand uh, through uh, the growers co-op. So it's kind of unique. Uh, we just heard that Laura Garber from Homestead Organics is not able to make it. So uh, it would have been great, but unfortunately she can't make it. And then Anthony, who we just uh, just popped in <laughs> a little early, is going to be joining us from Omnibar. And so he, Anthony, is uh, doing the marketing program for Omnibar, which if anybody hasn't heard of them, is a small, um, uh, I don't know, not necessarily energy bar, but kind of a granola bar type product that just started this past year. And they've just had tremendous brand uh, appearance in the last few months. And they're kind of all over the place. So that'll be real interesting to hear what they've done with their uh, grass-fed beef program. Uh, but that's about it for the agenda today. So maybe, maybe there's a couple new faces and maybe some new folks online. So we'll just do some quick introductions about who we all are and just so we can get to know each other even better. And then we'll just get rolling right into today's activity. And then so for the folks online, uh, please just, it looks like you're already using that chat bar at the bottom. So if you have questions, just uh, chime them in and then uh, Annie or myself will uh, relay, relay those to whoever the presenter might be or uh, discussion in the audience, what have you. Uh, but please, it's kind of an open conversation. So if you do have questions, please come forward with them. Um, so I guess I'll start. I, I'm Seth Swanson with Missoula County Extension here, um, Horticulture Extension Agent. Um, Amita? I'm Amita Greer, and I'm with Montana CDC, and I do uh, business advising with four small businesses. I'll talk a little bit more about what we do when I present. I'm with Zuhas, and I have a very small CSA, and I'm looking to grow it. I'm Kristen von Dorsten, and I'm with Zuhas, and I'm looking to grow it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Von Dorsten, and I'm with Zuhas, and I'm looking to grow it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Von Dorsten, and I'm with Zuhas, and I'm looking to grow it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Von Dorsten, and I'm with Zuhas, and I'm looking to grow it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Von Dorsten, and Kind of special, specialize in cheese making. My name is Marsha Hart, and um, from Hart's Gardens, we're just kind of southwest in, uh, in the Target Range area. We have a couple greenhouses, we sell um, flowers, vegetables, and we grow them for the same. George Hart, and we also sell some culinary herbs, and our expectation is by the end of this year, we will be growing in our greenhouse year round. We hope to get a geothermal furnace and uh, to just never stop growing again. <laughs> um, Montreal Leiden, uh, me and my mom just moved to Montana. We got some, some acreage over in Potomac and we're, yeah, we're just starting this year. So just trying to maintain for this year and then grow as every year goes, goes by. Hunter's mom. <laughs> <laughs> Julie. 
Um, I'm Annie Heiser. I work for the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, who's putting on this program with um, these guys. And then um, I would um, give you some names of some folks who are online with us today. We have um, John Campbell <coughs> and Billings, um, and he has been growing chemical-free produce for the Healthy by Design Gardeners Market and the Yellowstone Farmers Market for the last couple of years, and also selling to pro um, so local restaurants in Billings. Um, Tom Scheide, who has um, some family land outside of Billings and um, is currently in California but looking to get back. Um, Claire Lichtenfels, who's actually uh, online from New Zealand right now, but she's taking over management of a 10-acre blueberry farm out in western Washington, and so doing some research from there. Um, we have Jenny Grossenbecker, who is, works for MSU Extension in Bozeman and works with a lot of farmers, so is kind of taking this to help her help farmers. Um, and then Kate Rosetto, who's from Billings, She's an um, herbalist, aromatherapist, um, and she has a market garden in CSA, and she does all natural beauty and wellness products. Um, and Estella Hammond, who was here last week. So. I'm Dessa Dale, and I'm in the process, uh, my husband and I are in the process of starting Hawthorne Farms, which is uh, Dexter cattle, raising Dexter cattle on smaller acreages, as well as we're looking at trying to add in hogs eventually, and then also doing some dried flowers and um, other, I guess, produce, but, uh, and, and small orchard uh, apples and that sort of stuff. Um, so I guess we're having a little bit of problems for the folks um, online hearing, and that's probably because we, we should have passed around a mic with everybody. But if we do have um, problems hearing speakers, we have a mic, so hopefully they won't have that issue. And then, if we do have some questions from the crowd, we'll, we'll repeat them so that hopefully we don't miss anything. Um, all right, without further ado, let's get on and meet up. Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. I had the same problem once. Last... I know, it just doesn't like me. Do the old-fashioned way, I guess. But. I think once you get going. I think it's all so sick. It says you just stand up there. <laughs> <laughs> it obviously doesn't like me. Okay, so Montana CDC, just quickly, I think um, since we have some new people online, we're basically a nonprofit bank and we provide consulting and lending services to small businesses. In terms of our loans, um, we lend throughout Montana. How we're different than a bank is that we are more flexible than a bank in terms of requirements, and because of that flexibility, our interest rates are one or two points higher than a bank. So we're not really competing with banks. If a business owner can get all or part of their financing through a bank, that is their best bet, but if they can't, then we are another option. And then in terms of our consulting services, I do that through the Small Business Development Center, just general business planning, marketing operations. We also have uh, PTAC, stands for Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and they provide uh, government contracting help. And we also do trainings as well. So we already went through introductions. So um, diving into the marketing. Okay, so some of you are already in business, some of you are gonna start in business, and this, is, this will happen to you. You're gonna have people come out of the woodwork and say you should start a blog. You should ha definitely have a website. You should post your pictures on Instagram. You should do Pinterest. You should be on this site. You should do this. You should do radio, TV. You can have so much information and advice from other people about how to do marketing. And a lot of people come to me to ask for marketing advice. And I always start from the basics. I think it's really important. No matter what type of business you're in, whether you have to do more face-to-face -face marketing and not much you know, marketing in terms of social media or whether you really have to do a lot more social media marketing, the basics remain the same no matter what you do. And so what I'm gonna talk about really is the basics of marketing, the fundamentals, no matter what you do, if you know these concepts, they will always serve you. So the first thing is you really need to understand your sweet spot. I'm sure you've heard of this concept. Um, it's really, really useful. 
especially when you're in the beginning stages and you're trying to figure out what products or services you're going to provide. But it's also useful, even if you're not, even if you've run your business, to really make sure that the products and services that you're providing is really your sweet spot. It also helps you brainstorm if you're thinking about, um, if you're exploring different products or services. So <coughs> you have three circles here. You have your, the first one is your, your company's capability. So what are you doing? What are you, want, what are you offering or what do you want to offer? I would just list everything that you want to offer. And then you have your customer's needs. Now, if you're in the beginning of the, this process, then you're gonna, you may not know exactly. That's the whole point of doing the business plan, is to figure out that research. But what do you think your customer's needs are when it comes to your market, your industry? And then you have your competitor's offerings. Obviously, you need to understand what's happening in your market in regards to your competitors. And the ideal goal is to find where those circles intersect. And this, ideally, is where you're going to rely on, this is how you build your business, on this, on your sweet spot, that core product or service that you will be providing. So we are going to use the worksheets in our workbook. So if you go to page, it's page 56, worksheet 19. We're going to spend a few minutes just. Does anybody want uh, scrap? Worksheet 19. Yeah, we have XP a lot of ones we can work on right now. From the ones we did last time and from the ones we're doing this time. So. We're going to spend a few minutes and just get our juices flowing and think about, okay, what is our product? What's our service that we're going to provide? So page uh, 56, worksheet 19, it's product and uniqueness. So this worksheet really is just to help you figure, you know, think about, list your product down. Who do you think would want this product? And is it easy for competitors to imitate? Is it not? So let's spend a few minutes, because many of you, it sounds like many of you already have a, your product and service. Just start jotting down what you, your products. Okay, let's come back together. I know many of you are still writing, but I um, wanted to hear from you here in the classroom or online, tell me why, you, why, did you, you know, if you, why did you pick your product? What do you think your sweet spot is? Um, it's not necessarily to do with my product, because my product I think is pretty uh, prolific out there. There's a lot of chemical-free local produce. Mm -hmm. But um, because I'm adding in delivery, I think that will hopefully target a different segment of population that normally doesn't take time to shop at markets or going to CSA, typically. Okay. Just too busy or gone out of town. Okay, so Liz's sweet spot, you think, is the delivery part of it, the service part of it? Yeah. Okay. Great. And you? Um, I think our sweet spot will be um, we're going to have very late ripening cherry trees. Mm -hmm. And so the Washington market is trying to extend their market in cherries. So they're growing varieties later into the season, which is currently crossing over with the Montana um, sweet cherries. And so now the Montana growers are trying to extend their season. Mm. So try to compete. Also, okay. well, the market is one of the cherries right. to extend the overall cherry growing. Great. And as you guys are answering, if you could just try and pipe up so people online can hear you, that'd be awesome. Thanks. <coughs> Anybody else? I was going to pick on Annie and your and her husband yeah, about why why sheep. <laughs> no, I guess we kind of picked it just because of how uh, kind of rare it is regionally. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more common like Europe. Uh, yeah, we're hoping people will just kind of be into it because, because of that. Right. So there's no other. There's not many products out there that fit. There's this yeah, whole. Well, and even the rest of the cheese that's made within the state, they don't make a specific kind of cheese product like we're going to be making. Like they make, there's a lot of places that either make hard cheeses, like Lifeline makes cheddar, and right. Flathead Lake Cheese makes Gouda, you know, they make kind of harder <coughs> cheeses, but when Emil Thea and Bozeman makes like a really soft goat cheese, but this will be more like a brie hmm. kind of cheese, so it's something that will be different from other areas around the state too, or other, you know, even not, there's no sheep dairies, but 
this will be different even from <coughs> other kinds of dairies. Great, great. So yeah, it's really important to think about your product and what your sweet spot is. And if you're in the beginning process of this business planning, then you may not necessarily know, and that's fine too. Um, it will come to you as you continue to do that research. And Annie will share these slides, so just to let people know. Okay, so the crux of your marketing, it really begins with your customers and their needs. Sorry, I'm, it's not, and for some reason the PowerPoint slides look different here. And, and I think of it as an equation. So on the left side, it's your customers and their needs. And then it equals what problem your product or service is solving. It's sort of like when you're first beginning to date, if you have that first love, you really want to know everything about that customer, right? You meet somebody, you want to know everything about that person. Um, in terms of demo, demo, demographics, I'm going to skip a little, well, let me just go back to this. So in terms of demographics, you know, in terms of age, number of, number, you know, does he have uh, brothers or sisters, all that information, but you also want to know what their values are. What, what makes them tick? So it's really important to know your customer. A lot of times people will ask me, okay, do you think TV is a good way to do it? Or do you think you know, putting a print ad is a good way or flyers? And I'm always asking, well, what does your, how does your customer get that information? So it is an equation. Your customers and their needs should match what you are providing to meet that need. That is the ideal relationship that you're trying to find. And I put this, this um, example of slow food. You know, it's an idea, a way of living, and a way of eating. So the slow food movement has certain customers or certain people who really resonate with the slow food. And I think a lot of local farmers and ranchers kind of are in that movement in terms of it has certain values attached to that. Okay. So I love this cartoon. I hear this quite a lot. Everyone is my customer. Everybody eats. So therefore, everyone could be my customer. Everybody needs clothes. Everybody could be my customer. No, it's not true. Not everyone is going to be your customer. You cannot build a business on everyone being your customer. It doesn't work like that. What you really need to do is figure out that core customer, the customer that really gets it. And that's why I think of it as an equation. Your customer and their, need, and their needs, and then you meet that need. And that's a particular type of customer. So. Getting back to the dating analogy, you have to love your customer. And when you're first starting to date, you're trying to figure out everything about them, right? A healthy, in a healthy way, it's not an obsession. But you're trying to, <laughs> but maybe in a business, in a business, it will become an obsession and it should continue to be an obsession, but in a healthy, healthy way. You have to love your customer and um, you have to know their demographics. So this is an example that I just put in here of age demographics of social networking users. I really couldn't find much stuff on demographics um, of related to agriculture. Um, so, you know, who uses Facebook, who uses Twitter, and this is just by age. So this is an example. For you, it's, you know, age, income level, gender, who tends to buy your product more? Is it mostly women? Is it mostly men? Or it could be a combination. You know, where do they live? income level, all the basic, what I think of hard data. Where can you get that information? Through the census, you can get it through census. There's tons of resources out there. You can get it through census. There's also a great uh, website called Montana Site Selector. I know for, and it, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Montana Site Selector. So if you go to Montana Site Selector, the unfortunate part is that your city or county has to pay in in order to get much more in-depth research. I know the Missoula area has that. Missoula County has that. So you can click on your location or where you think your customers are going to be, and it provides amazing data on average amount that a customer spends on different products, and it gives you tons of information on just customers around that area. So it's pretty cool. So, you know, in the initial dating, you just kind of get the demographics. But as you start to get to know that person, you really want to know what the psychographics is, what their values are. 
what do they really care about, right? I mean, that's the, when you start a long-term relationship, when you're getting married, that's the whole point, is our, my values match your values. We have something in common, we have some type of bond. And so this is um, psychographic information, an example. This is from um, the or USDA Organic Association, and just, you know, more parents are buying organic, 48% think it's healthier for me and my children. So it has a lot to do with values on the left-hand side in terms of organics. And then this, I use, I like this example because it's kind of what you should be doing for your business plan. So this is uh, social media users, or social media users slash technology users. And what it does is it groups people into different categories. So you have the avoiders. They look out to the sea but are happy to keep their feet on dry land. So people who are just totally out, they, they're not into technology, they're not gonna use it. But then you have people who are immersers, like fish who live and swim in the medium without giving it a second thought. So it kind of groups people based on their values, their attitudes, what they care about. The whole point of doing the psychographics information is so you can understand how they make that purchasing decision. What is important to them? when they make that purchasing de decision. How do they make that purchasing decision? This is more of a challenge. It's definitely more of a challenge. And it's continuous. It's not something that you, know, you start your business, you will know a lot more as you interact with your customers. And it should, you should always do it because your customers can shift in terms of their needs slightly as you, as you start your business. So tell me, how do you think you can get this type of information? Yes. How they like to get their information. Definitely you could do surveys. Interviews. A, interviews, right. More in-depth interviews with your customers. And, and also other producers. Um, just right. based on something you had asked me to do, that was actually very helpful. Right, right. So uh, wh what I always say is to contact businesses like yours somewhere else where you're not competing with them and ask them um, who their customers are best marketing strategies, uh, how do they find that customer. That is really one of the best ways because it's somebody who's done it before you. <clears throat> ideally, you want to find some, ideally you want to find other businesses that are in a very similar geographic region. I mean, that's ideal, but sometimes you're not going to find that. So you at least want to talk to as many businesses that are in the same type of um, industry or industry that you're in, <clears throat> selling the same type of products. And a lot of it will be just um, talking to people, talking to customers. But it, it really depends. If you're doing more of a distribution type of product or service where you're not, you're not at a farmer's market. It's not where you see your customers on a daily basis. You're going to distribute your product. It's going to be at a grocery store. Um, then that's going to be a little bit more challenging. And this is where you, know, you talk to as many distributors in this, in this field as possible. Talk to buyers. I was working with somebody who wanted to uh, make a food, a food product in the grocery, and they, he wanted to sell it just through the grocery store. So <clears throat> I told him, go to all the buyers of the local soup, soup grocery stores and ask the buyers, okay, what do you think about my product? Who's, who really buys this product? What do they think about their packaging? So a lot of the business planning, market planning, really is just doing lots of research online, talking to people. It's pretty, um, I think a lot of people, when you hear the word market research, people get really intimidated and they think it's like lots of databases and these amazing research studies, and it's not that, not for most businesses. It's just getting out there. And always knowing that if you haven't started your business, you're never gonna know. You know, as you start your business, be prepared that it may not be what you think it is. You may realize that your customers may not want, or they're buying your product for a very, a slightly different reason than what you think it is. And that's okay too. Because it's, it's a living, breathing document. So we are going to spend some time to think about our customers. Worksheet 18, page 55. Does anybody have questions about what I talked about? Demographics, psychographics? Yes, Maybe Liz? You're talking about segments of your customer, like a customer segment. Right. Is that just a type of person? Is that yeah, so 
Yeah, so it's, it's, these are customer segments right here, these mm -hmm. buckets, avoiders, coasters, users. They're on a different um, t paradigm of technology users. So for, for um, a lot of small businesses, they usually don't have just one customer segment. Like one, it's not the, you know, if I'm, like, for example, if I have a, a women's clothing store downtown, you know, I'm, I'm going to say that my main, my core customer is that professional woman that has a lot of more discretionary income. And she's a mother too, but maybe anywhere from 30 to 55, and she makes over $60,000, blah, 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 blah. But I also know that another customer segment is um, college crowd. They don't have as much discretionary income, but they're willing to spend a little bit more money on certain pieces of clothing. So that's a totally different customer segment, right? So some of you may have um, one or two, one major customer segment. Some of you may have totally two or three different customer segments. And it totally depends on how, di you know, it's the differentiation. Because the reason you segment your customers is because how you market to them can be totally different. You know, how that professional woman, I'm going to market to that, if I have a clothing store, I'm going to market to that person very differently than um, a college woman, woman's a college. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great question. So getting to that worksheet, let's spend, <coughs> let's spend. Was it worksheet 18? Oh, sorry, no, it isn't. You're right. I'm looking at it. It's not. It's worksheet six. Is it 16? Yep. Thanks, Annie. Worksheet 16, customer segmentation. Page 53. So spend a few minutes and, you know, what I would do, you may have several, however you want to do it. You can list all your customers that you think are, you know, in different buckets is what I like to think of them. Or you can focus on one customer segment and really think about <clears throat> the geographic, demographic, psychographic. And geographic really is where are they? Where are those customers? If you're distributing a product, then they could be anywhere, so. Okay, so let's come back as a group. I know some of you are not done, and, and you should not be done in terms of getting actual in-depth in information, because this, this is really hard, I think. I think it's really hard to get into the mind and hearts of your customers, but that's exactly what you have to do in order to really have a good marketing strategy. You do all the hard work now in terms of trying to understand your customers, then your marketing strategy will fall into place because you know exactly where that customer goes for, um, for their food. You know exactly what radio stations they listen to. You know what type of magazines they read. You know where they go online. Though that's the, um, how in-depth you should go and you may not have it right in the beginning. That's okay, because you haven't started your research. And even with existing business owners I meet all the time, they still don't know who, you know, how can they reach their customers. So it's always, um, <clears throat> it's a circular process. I think you're always learning about your customers. Just like if you're in a relationship, you're always learning something new about your partner. So it's the same type of um, <clears throat> dynamic. But I wanted to hear from you. Tell me, tell me, one of your customer segments, or s several of your customer segments. <laughs> I'll pick on people if some, nobody volunteers. We've been trying to think of whether it's worth it and, and the market strategy for adding cut flowers to our diversified okay. farm. And so one market segment we identified potentially would be bed and breakfast owners. Hmm. Okay people wanting to, so that would be you know, near in our region, so delivery was reasonable within the Hamilton Corrales area. Right. Um, and so they're mostly sort of in the demographic would be small business owners. Right. Themselves. Right. And Who may need flowers on a regular basis. Trying to get yeah. kind of add value to what they're offering. Right. Um, yeah, so we'd be looking for those that are wanting to use that to leverage their own plants. So we have mm -hmm. local organic mm -hmm. flowers. Mm -hmm. so. Right. And you, you would, I don't know if you've done that, if you've gone to the point where we're asking potential, p your potential, that. you're just getting that right. You would just ask and say, what do you think? Do you think it's something that you would need? Right. Great. How about others? Online too. <laughs> Guess so. One of our segments would be like hobby farms, so people interested in raising 
their own um, livestock, uh, purchasing it from us, raising it so that they can have right. that experience. And so I kind of call them the hobby farms. They're looking at self-sustainable style of living within a certain within certain parameters. And so they're looking for uh, a type of cow that either can provide them milk or beef or both um, through their own ability to raise. So it would be something that we might provide additional um, services like uh, they could call us for advice on how to work with their animal. And we would spend a lot more time with that animal on halter training and gentling so it would be considered a true family cow. Mm. And they're not looking for a higher niche, pro like a higher the same genetics that we might focus on with some of our breeding stock, but they would be looking for something that's lower class but still quality to them. So tell me why um, why a hobby farm would choose your type of cattle. Tell me. Well, um, the type of cattle that we have, Dexter, is, mm -hmm. is considered the smallest type, and so they uh, use 30%. They're able to go on 30% less forage than a traditional cow. So for smaller homesteads, they're extremely desirable. You can raise them on a five to 10 acre homestead a lot easier than, you know, you don't need all of the acreage. That and um, Dexter's produce the same amount of milk fat as a Jersey, but not in the quantities of like a milk cow. So for somebody who might want to milk, but not want to get two or three gallons or more of milk a day, they can easily get one to two gallons or even less if they're not taking the cap off. So it, it's something that is in a lot more manageable qualities. That and the meat that they get off of it is a it's smaller size. So instead of having a thousand pounds of meat in the freezer, they might only have five hundred pounds. It's an extremely flavorful, well mar marbled meat, and they're known mm -hmm. for doing well um, as browsers instead of grazers. So they can actually do well on poorer quality forage than um, having to put a lot of inputs in higher quality forage. Great. So you. When you were, in your answer, you gave us so much information in terms of demographics of your hobby farm and psychographics of your, of your hobby farm, right? In terms of hobby farm, smaller acreage, they don't have a huge, huge family. Um, in terms of psychographics, they obviously want an animal that they can kind of maintain and have that local, you know, having direct access to it. And they, but it's not, it's something that's manageable, right? So, I mean, there's tons of, um, data that you gave me regarding demographics and psychographics. And that's the kind of, um, this is an example, a great example of demographics and psychographics of your customer. Now it's really important because many of you have multiple products that you are providing. Pretty um, common with local farmers and agricultural producers. And so you're going to have multiple segments. So the most important thing is, as you, you may right now have multiple segments, and you're not really sure exactly where you're going to target. Really common. What you want to look for is the lowest hanging fruit. I love that term. Lowest hanging fruit. You know, as you kind of do that research in terms of demographics, you do that research in terms of psychographics, you want to find that market that totally gets your product or service. I mean, if you have local produce that you're providing, <coughs> It's going to be really hard to sell that produce through Safeway. Some Safeways have, you know, feature local products, but that's going to take a lot more work than if you go to the farmers market or if you go to a local health a local health store, right? Just a little bit easier. So same concept, lowest hanging fruit. You may have multiple segments, but what in which way can you which is easier? So that's definitely um, an important factor when it comes to picking your market segments. And can, do you have enough of a customer segment? Any questions? I think, too, that you can get as in-depth on this kind of stuff or as not in-depth as you want. I mean, it, and I think about like a farmer's market vendor. Oh, hearing myself talk twice. Um, you know, you can think about it like, OK, these are, this is who's coming by the farmer's market You know, in, in a more general level. Or you can think about like, the kind of farmer's market person that I want to attract is looking for certain kinds of varieties. And so I'm going to pick these varieties that are really early um, producers because then I'm going to have the first berries in the market. Or I'm going to pick you know, very different kinds of beets because I know that my customers are looking for a, very, a more beautiful and you know, a different kind of product that they would find in the grocery store. Or you, know, you see the people that come to the farmer's market in like 
August and they are only selling cucumbers because they know that people are just looking for pickling cucumbers mm -hmm. and that's all that they're going to sell for. Yeah. So, I mean, as much as I think that you can get, you know, as, as would you agree, as in-depth yes. as not mm -hmm. as you want. Definitely. The more in-depth you can get, the more helpful. Yeah. And, you know, if you're be a farmer's market, that's wonderful because right then you, you, you have, you're interacting with your customers and you can capture so much information from them. You know, just by obviously they're, they're, you see them, so just basic characteristics, that's the demographics, right? Male, female, age, all that stuff. But also the psychographics. And that comes from talking to people, doing surveys, you know, what they like, what they don't like. So that's, that's also very important. And it's ongoing. You're never going to feel like you know your customer 100%. That's not the point. It's just you, you want to really get to know them. You want to love them. Okay, so customer empathy map. I love this exercise, it's hard. So the customer empathy map is one tool to help you get into the mind and heart of your customer. We're not gonna do, we're not gonna do it now. And in your worksheet, unfortunately, it's a little bit blurry, but you have my PowerPoint slide. I think it's a little clearer in here than it. Oh, is it than what I printed maybe? Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. <coughs> Ignore what I said. This must be my printer. Okay, so um, customer empathy map, just to, qu to quickly go over it. So when you have, you're gonna have multiple, if you have multiple customer segments, you would do a customer empathy map for, map for each customer segment. And if you have lots and lots of them, I would really just focus on your core customer, the core customers, okay? And so what does your, in thinking about your core customer, like Dessa's hobby farm, you can use that as an example. So those hobby farmers, um, you know, what does she say and do? What's their attitude in public and appearance? What's the, her behavior towards others? So what you really want to try to do is like, you want to understand her world. You want to understand your customer's world. What's going on in your customer? Now, this is a generalization. Everybody is unique, but what you want to figure out is what's happening in general regarding your customer segment. You know, what does she think and feel? What counts? What are her worries and aspirations? What does she see? And what seeing means is like, what's happening? Around, around this customer segment. What's going on? Um, what does she hear? What friends say, what boss says, what influencers say. So this is, you know, how does this person get, or this customer segment, how do they get this in their information? How do they get it? Um, and then pain and gain. So what, what is this person's frustrations, obstacles, when it comes to your business? Not just, you know, personal pains and frustrations, but when it comes to your uh, market. And then gain. How does this person define success? What is this customer's wants and needs? It's really hard, but I think it's a great tool to help you really get into the, the mind and to help you figure out what the psychographics information is. Now, go ahead. Sorry, one quick question. Sure. Would that be peers or more media? Or what, what are influencers? Are? So, yeah, good question. So the question was, what in what does she hear, what, what does influencers mean? And it can be those things. It could be social media, it could be peers. It totally depends on the customer segment. Yeah. So I think it's a good tool. I would recommend that you use it. It's challenging. And a lot of times you would have to talk to your customers. Um, in the previous example, in the psychographics information, I, let me just go back to it. So I got this from the USDA Organic Association. Um, exactly don't know what the name of it is, but it's a trade association that represents organic farmers that get certified, okay? They have so much information on their website about their customers. All of your trade associations that you fall into will have tons of information. Unfortunately, sometimes they, it's, some of it information is free and then sometimes you have to pay thousands of dollars to do it. I don't recommend paying thousands of dollars to get those reports. But it's a great place to start. And what I, again, what I would do is contact other businesses like yours somewhere else. They can tell you. Tell me who your customers are. What do they care about? What do they value? That's how you would get this type of information and help you figure out what this, um, what's in the customer empathy map. Any questions on that? Market research, I mean, I've been talking about it throughout the presentation in terms of how do you figure out who your customer is and what do they care about. 
But this is key, and it kind of um, fits into the third session that we're doing where we're talking about fi finan finances and projections. One of the biggest challenges that business owners have, whether you're new or existing, but especially if you're a startup, is figuring out what your sales are going to be. It's really challenging. Um, even if you're an existing business, usually if the hard part is you know, they want to grow into a new segment and that's a whole new territory or they want to capture more customers and it's really hard to figure out what your sales are going to be. So how would you figure this out? How are you going to do this? Obviously, um, it's all part of the market research. And what have people done? I'm going to ask what people have done. We've piloted, Noah? we tried to see if we could get people to like pony up $150 of produce and uh, based on that, we're like, okay, we've got a few people that paid, you know, $150 for produce. We've got a couple people who paid $365 for a direct whole lamb. So that's kind of how we're thinking about our customers. If we can get, mm -hmm. you know, 100 people to spend $300 each, that's a gross revenue of $30,000. So we've, we've, we're doing piloting now, selling our, our, our produce and packaged USDA butchered land. Great. That is a wonderful suggestion. And it kind of goes to um, that it, you're never going to know 100%. So piloting is great. If you can do that, that's wonderful. Test it out. See what happens. A lot of this information, you, I mean, in terms of how many customers do you have, you can always look at your competitors too. So if you're at the farmer's market, or if you know somebody who's been there, you know, I would ask them, okay, tell me what the tra traffic flow is. You know, how many people on average, average number of sales. And if you have a very different product, completely unique, that it's not in your market, which is, can be positive, but then the hard part is, how do I pro pro project what my sales are? Again, and uh, you know we provide loans, so this is one of the hardest things is, um, can we believe this person's projections? Will we lend based on these projections? And so it's basically getting that data from other businesses. I keep harping about it, but that's exactly how it is. It's never gonna be 100%. What we wanna always find out from other businesses like yours somewhere else, or is average number of customers that come how much, on average, does a customer spend per transaction? When I say average number, going back, average number of customers, now that can vary totally. You know, it could be average number of customers per day, it could be average number of customers per season, whatever, you know, however you sell your, your, your um, product or service. So average number of customers will tell you the number of customers. Average amount that a customer spends will tell you the average sales price. So that gives you sales unit times sales price, which is, well, you know, equals your sales volume. And then the frequency, how often do your customers come back? That's really important because it's seasonality. You need to know the seasonality when it comes to your projections. So the more data points you can get from other businesses, like yours somewhere else, it will lay a foundation for how you, proje how you project your sales. It's never going to be 100%. You're never going to feel like this is exactly what my sales are going to be, but it's going to be as close to a crystal ball that you're going to get. So kind of doing that type of market research, talking to other businesses, looking at your competition, which we'll talk about next, um, will all help you figure out what your sales are going to be. Any questions on that? On, in, the, um, in your book, there's tons of uh, there's a whole list of different market research ideas. So surveys are good. The, the, the issue with surveys is that you have to have really good questions. And a lot of times, unless you, a lot of times uh, questions can be really skewed. How happy are you with my product? <laughs> For example. <laughs> can really skew the answers. So, but they're great. Um, SurveyMonkey is good if you actually have an existing customer list. Survey, have you, anybody ever used SurveyMonkey.com? You could just create your survey and send it out through email. If, if your customers, all your customers have emails, if you have that information, that's a great way to do it, especially if you're testing out new products to your existing customers, talking to them, observing. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. 
So um, you might find this thinking a bit flawed, but under um, one of our products are listified, listed as uh, basically a, a farm stand. One thing that we're trying to do is by working with, uh, by growing and working with a small network of farmers is really create like this whole diet and ethos for a few different customer geographics and demographics. And um, so that's, that's the product basically, a farm stand, a place where people can come by and pick up basically a diversified diet. So we're, we're kind of getting, you know, the demographics would be the farmer's market carryovers, those, those, those customers that run out of food during the middle of the week or just want to pick up something. The local foodies, um, neighbors and drivers, people who pass by on mm -hmm. Old Corvallis Road. So the product is kind of difficult. It's like a location and ethos, a place where people can stop by. And there aren't many stop by farms in, in the area. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. what do you think of, about that as, as the product? I don't think of, I don't think of a, that as a product. I think that, that of that as the way you, your distribution. So what you're selling, at, I understand what you're saying in terms of having multiple farmers use um, that distribution strategy to get your product into customers. So whatever you're selling at the farm stand is your product. Um, and the way you're distributing that is through a farm stand, which is a very, it's a different type of distribution system than doing a farmer's market in some sense or through a uh, broker selling it through grocery stores. So in terms of your customer segment, it's you know who goes to farm stands. And you kind of mentioned that, people who are leftovers from the farmer's market, and then people who drive by. Obviously, location is pretty important. Does that make sense? Yeah, because you have a uni it's a unique distribution system. Would you have the farm stand open all the time, or would you advertise that it would be open at certain times? This would be open all the time, yeah. You can do like a way and pay, like someone doesn't always have to so like on the honor system, someone doesn't always have to be there. You just have to stuff out with a scale and then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we, we visited some successful stands that, that do that. Way and pay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what you're doing is you have, you're trying to provide a unique distribution system. That's not really um, prevalent in this market. Right, and that's, I guess that's part of the whole magic, trying to create a new product that essentially a new market. Right. Right. Yeah. We've talked to a bunch of farmers, uh, like in Hamilton, and we'll do the farmers market there, but from all of our data, which is just, just from talking to like uh, a handful of farmers up there that are friends and they just lay out their finances, mm -hmm. and from what we know with our farmer friends in Missoula, those those farmers really aren't making them. There aren't, there's just fewer and fewer dollars, so we really have to try to capture these right. right. markets. Right, yeah. And we're going to, in the panelists, we're going to talk a lot about the different distribution strategies. Yeah. Well, and even if there, I mean, there are two different farm stands that I can think of down in that area, but, you know, you might look at people who have farm stands in, like, the Willamette Valley, mm -hmm. somewhere that's kind of similar, you know, yeah. that in a, in a place where it might have a similar kind of traffic flow, and you can get traffic counts from the Department of Transportation to find out how many people are driving by that street and whatnot. Yeah, something yeah like that. we visited so, one uh, successful farm stand in the Willamette Valley. I wish we were closer, they'd be mentors, but they're, they've got to be a million dollar a year business. They're just incredible, huh? and it's, it's uh, it's just a couple there. They sell to the public's market as well, but their farm stand is incredible. Great. Competitive advantage, one of my favorite topics. Um, there's this great book called The Myth of Excellence. You can't be all things. It's another thing that I always find in when I read business plans. So I'm going to be the best at everything. My competitors suck. I, however, am the best. <laughs> I see that all the time. It's not true. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And according to the authors of The Myth of Excellence, there's, customers don't want that. Customers don't want you to be the best at everything. It's just too confusing. It's too confusing for a customer. 
What does that mean? What does that mean? So there's this wonderful um, rating system that they use. So your competitive advantage, well, let's, you know, I kind of just dived in. What is competitive advantage? What does that word mean? What gives you maybe to the to a certain customer segment, what gives you, what brings them to you versus somebody else that has a similar product? <sighs> yes, it's what are you the best at? What differentiates you from somebody else? What are you the best at? So your competitive advantage is going to be one of these factors. To make it easier for you, there's five factors where you can compete. Product, price, product, access, service, and experience. So quickly go through them. Price obviously is you know, the price of your product. Product is the product quality. What's the, how does your um, product quality fit within the market? Access is how easy is it for me to access your business. Now that can have multiple meanings. If you actually have a physical location, it's things like, can I easily get to your location? Is there pl plenty of parking? Farmer's market. If you sell at farmer's market, where are you in the farmer's market? You have to look at the, the flow of traffic, right? You know, what is that? How does that position and location in the farmer's market impact your sales? It could, it's also internet. If you sell products online or if you connect with your customers, can I get onto your website very easily? Do you have, which is a really big pet peeve of mine, is, is there contact information on your website where I can call you? and and we've all had experiences where we're trying to find, you know, you go on the website and you're trying to find the owner and you're trying to figure out where the number is or you're trying to reach them and you just can't. That's really frustrating. So how easy, it, easy is it to access that business? And then service is customer service. Do you provide good customer service? And then experience is, so it's experience from the customer's point of view, not from your point of view, from the customer's point of view. What is that, is that what is that customer? experience that the customer has interacting with your business. So I mean, farmer's market is crucial, right? You have to be a people person if you're going to sell at the farmer's market. You're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to present. You're going to have to be on all the time. So you have to make sure you have skills at that, good skills on that. Okay, so those are the five product, five factors. And the rating system works like this. Your five is your competitive advantage. Four is you're a little bit better at this factor than your competitors, but you're not the best at it. And then three is industry par. You're no, um, no better or no worse than your competitors. Basically, nobody's really competing regarding this factor in your market. So let's just use an example, a really easy example, Walmart. What's Walmart's competitive advantage? Price. 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 Yep. Yeah. I have never had anybody get it wrong. <laughs> it's price. It's actually a very um, beautiful model in terms of the, the theory. Um, Walmart competes on price. Price is a very difficult, sustainable competitive advantage for most business owners. Because what happens? Let's say you want, I'm going to have the lowest price, which is really common for a lot of business, new business owners. Um, you know, I hear a lot with a lot of consultants like photographers, you know, I'm new in this market, so I think I feel, I feel like I have to set my price a little bit low. Yeah. But what's the issue with that? What's the issue if that's your competitive advantage? It's harder to raise your price later on. Harder to raise your price or your customers may complain, but you just have to have somebody else come into your market and slap, have a little bit lower price and then their your competitive, competitive advantage evaporates. So, but Walmart's price Customer knows its price. There is no confusion. When customers go to Walmart, they know exactly what they're getting. They know, they trust that they're going to get the lowest price, right? And what does Walmart market on its radio? I don't know if it does radio, but TV commercials, always low prices. Online, always low prices with that smiley face, right? It's, that is, in terms of the principle, the framework, that's exactly what you should do. Once you figure out what your competitive advantage is, you have to obviously make sure that your customers want your competitive advantage. And that kind of goes to that equation that I was talking about in the beginning when I said it first starts with the customer and their needs and then equals what are you providing and how are you sol uh, solving that need? How are you meeting their needs? So that is the equation and that's what your competitive advantage has to be. So let's 
Another example that I give is downtown coffee shops in Missoula or wherever you are downtown. I know we have people from California and New Zealand. Picture your downtown area. Hopefully you have coffee shops in your downtown area. But I'm going to use Missoula because that's where we are. You have several coffee shops. So what are some threes for co coffee shops downtown? Price is definitely a three. I have never heard anybody say, I'm going to this coffee shop because it's the lowest price when they go downtown. It's a three. They're not really competing based on price. Access is a three because they're all downtown. They're not really competing in terms of location, really. Um, we felt that two of them, like several of them probably compete. A four is um, a product. Some of them may have a little bit better product that they're providing. And then I felt that some coffee shops there, their four is service. They kind of have a little bit better service. But what their five is, and I think that goes a lot with a lot of the downtown um, restaurants and bars, is experience. They're all competing based on experience. Now what does that mean if you're a coffee shop or a restaurant or a bar downtown? That experience is, it's hard to capture. If you have a favorite coffee shop downtown or if you have a favorite bar downtown, it's hard to know exactly why you like it. You can say, well, I like the food, but there's something about that, you know, I like it. I like Zootown Brew because it's quiet. I love that. Some, somebody else may like Break Espresso because it's loud. It's great louder. It has a lot more um, seating. So there's, it captures the ambiance. And when I think of experience, I often think of brand. It goes beyond you know, the colors of your logo. It has a lot to do with customer service and access, but it's that, that loyalty that you, pr that you provide, that person has to that product. It's kind of Noah when he said last time, the devotee. Yeah. It's the, devo the person who, that customer that just loves you because of the experience. Now I'm not saying that all of you have to have experience as a five, but if I do my research, like for downtown, if I want to open up a coffee shop downtown, I know that if they're all fives, I'm going to have to compete against that. My, fi my five competitive advantage should be experience. You possibly can do another, you know, you could have products be an exp uh, your five, it would just be a different business model, I think. So I Dessa. can see to where you would have different competitive advantages based on your different market, who you're targeting, your target consumer. Yes. So how do you, I guess, do you have completely different marketing strategies for those consumers, or how do you blend that together? Yeah, it's going to be a challenge. So if you, and that really, I think, depends on your distribution system. So let's say you have a broker. A, a good example is, um, well, no, that's not a good example. A good, <laughs> um, I think most businesses will have one major competitive advantage. Um, you may have a slightly different one. It may, you know, be a four slash five, depending on your distribution strategy. You know, um, what, what the example that I was thinking of was gluten free mama. If anybody's had, I'm gluten-free, so Gluten-Free Mama, she manufactures gluten-free flours in Polson, and she sells, and initially she sold through local food health, like the good food store, all over the country. That's how she started, and now she's in uh, safe ways throughout the country as well. So um, for her, it's, you know, her, her five, it's kind of, you know, obviously when you're selling at um, a grocery store, Packaging has a lot to do with it, right? Packaging your product. I mean, that's really important. But Gluten-Free Mama is also great because she's created this experience for customers. People can go on her website. People can chat with her. She provides recipes on her blog. So she kind of creates this loyalty behind her. So yes, I mean, you know, you, the experience can be very difficult when you're at a, if you're going to market through a grocery store. It has, you know, so the experience is, what is that? It's the packaging, it's the product, and hopefully, they kind of connect with you through another way too. So definitely, it's, you may have slightly different competitive advantages, but it, to me that kind of goes more into the, how you market, marketing strategy. To make it easier, I think that all, most businesses will have one competitive advantage. So I guess I'm a little confused. Are you saying, let's say I'm at a coffee shop downtown. Yep. Is it best for you to have your five where everyone else has their fives? Or should you have your five somewhere completely different because everyone else has their fives and experience you should be now in price? Or is it? If I'm going to open up a coffee shop downtown, I'm most likely going to have my five be an experience. So you should be if, where everyone else is. Not necessarily. 
if I feel like, well, I'm, I don't want to do the same model. I'm, I'm going to have a stand downtown. I'm going to have a stand. I'm going to sell outstanding coffee, but it's going to be, I have a really small space. So the experience is not going to be as important. It's going to be the product. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, there is no, there is no um, rule that if everybody else is the five in service, that I should be, that should be my five. It, it just gives you a hint that, hmm, every, all of my competitors are focusing on service as a five. Should I do that? Yeah. You, you can't ignore it. Yeah. You can make a conscious decision to do something else as your competitive advantage, but you just have to know how does your business model work. Well, it wouldn't your competitive advantage, I mean, I, I think from what I'm hearing from you is maybe more of a focus on what uh, target audience you would be. So for example, McDonald's McCafe, their advertising for that would be vastly different from a yes. town brew. Yeah, right. So they're both hitting the coffee market and they're both focusing on good quality but just different. Yes. And it, it's, it's right now, like I said, I mean, this is the basic, so it's, it's principles and theory. When you start doing it, it will be, it'll become more clear to you. So when you analyze your competition, we're not going to focus on work. I mean, we're not going to do worksheet 18 right now, but that's the sheet on competition. What you need to do is look at your competitors, and I would recommend using this framework. Use this framework for your, from, for your competitors. List your competitors. You know, list their basic price, product, what you think they're serve, what kind of services they provide, accessibility, and what do you think they're, the experience is from the customer's point of view. List all that out. Yeah. So, I want to give you a break before we continue. Yes, yep, go ahead. There is no two and one. Yeah. The question was, yeah. the question was you know, I understood five, four, three, but what about two and one? There is no two and one in this framework. In this framework. So five is your competitive advantage, four is you're a little bit better than your competitors regarding this framework, and then three is industry par. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't. Ideally, you don't, want, Ideally, you don't want to fall below that. <laughs> okay. So okay. So marketing strategy. marketing strategy. If you do all your if you do all your research about customers, about customers really, understand really understand your customers, really understand, really understand how, they how they get that information, marketing strategy, marketing marketing strategy will be know, easy because you'll know. You know what? I'm not going to do TV. There's no way my customers no make, you know, the decision to buy my product through TV ads. I know where my customer, I know where my customer goes to make that decision. So that's my marketing strategy. We're not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about potential marketing strategies because this is really just the principles of how to figure that out. One, um, we're kind of running out of time, so you'll have this PowerPoint presentation. And this is, I don't know if you've ever read Guerrilla Marketing. I think that's great. I think that's great. Great strategy. Because I think a lot of people get really overwhelmed by marketing. They think they have to have a 30 page thesis on marketing strategies. Guerrilla Marketing is great because it's, um, they have tons of different books in their series, but it's really, you know, practical marketing strategies for small businesses, I think. Marketing, marketing implementation chart, chart, chart worksheet 23 in your, in your the book. The most important thing is to measure your marketing, your marketing efforts. Most businesses don't, most really, most businesses measure don't really measure their marketing efforts. How many customers, you know, how many do, you customers do you get when you go to the farmer's, when you go to the farmer's market? market? How, what's the average, the average amount that a customer at a farmer's market will spend on your product? Versus somebody who, versus who, somebody who, who does a CSA versus, versus some, other type, some other type of distribution strategy. So that marketing, so that marketing chart, if you, chart if you go to the worksheet 23, is just a tool, that just a tool to help you list, um, list you know, who's responsible for that marketing strategy, what, what, is, your marketing what, what is your marketing strategy, control. control. How are you going to measure, how that, you gonna marketing measure that marketing strategy? It could be something as simple as, how did you hear about me? You know, a lot of it's, how did you hear about me? That's a great way, just keep track of it. I think a lot of marketing, think a lot of mar collecting, that data, collecting that data is just mundane. mundane it's boring, mundane, it's boring, you just have to have a system. But over time, but over, time months, over months, six months, a year, six months you're going to have, you're gonna have data amazing data, data to help you figure next out for that next, next year, for that next exactly year I know exactly how I'm going to spend my dollars. Because mo most of us don't have um, unlimited marketing budgets, <laughs> if at all. So it's important to measure that marketing effort. Okay. I went over. I apologize. Um, how, how much? How long do you want to break? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Let's take a ten-minute break. So we'll be back at ten thirty-five.